be here this morning. I'm back in the study. We're going to pick up demons today, devils, and uh, get started on that. Father, I pray that you give me the gift of teaching and give the folks ears to hear, Father, and a heart that desires to learn and know. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn to the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19. James 2, 19. Scripture says, Thou believest that uh, there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The word translated devils here is demon, diamania, demon. Uh, the basic root meaning of the word means a knowing one or one that knows. It's akin to Gnosticism or Gnostic. The word means to know. It's a source of intelligence. It's one that you appeal to for instruction. If you sell your soul to Satan, you can appeal to demonic, uh, uh, to a demonic agency for power over people and authority. This is where rich witchcraft comes in, Satanism, and all the rest of it. There is definitely power in the spirit world. No question about it whatsoever. Now, first of all, I'll bring up the idea, where did demons come from? Where did they come from? There's a lot of conjecture. A lot of folks just point blank say, well, it's the fallen angels. That's a demon. Well, I don't necessarily buy into that. But let me give you some of the possibilities this morning. I've listed five of them. There may be more. Uh, one is the pre-Adamite race. People here before Genesis chapter number 1 and where the Bible says the earth was without form and void, then there might have been something here when God made the earth. He didn't make it without form and void. Isaiah 45 talks about the fact that he did not create it without form and void, tohu vabohu. So some believe that a demon is a spirit from a pre-Adamite race. In other words, pre-Adam, before Adam. Some believe they're fallen angels, as I said a moment ago. The Apostle Peter says that these fallen angels are in Tartarus. They're in the lowest hell. And then the third one is the born of angels and women. You know, when the angels in Genesis 6 came into the daughters of men, then uh, children were born to them, mighty men of renown, and called uh, Nephilim. They believe that demons are the product of, a of angels and human beings and women, Genesis 6. Some believe that demons are the spirits of the wicked dead who died before the flood. In other words, they died in the flood or before the flood. Some believe that the demon is a wicked spirit of the, or the spirit of the wicked dead. And then there are those who believe that demons are the, are the spirits of the wicked dead after the flood. In other words, the spirits of unsaved men and women who leave the world. Now, if that be true, then you have firm belief in what uh, the world believes is a ghost. Because what is a ghost supposed to be? A ghost is supposed to be the spirit of departed person uh, haunting an area and what have you. And they have all kinds of classifications for them. I believe in ghosts, but I do not believe that they're departed spirits of people. I believe they are demonic manifestations and that's exactly what is you're dealing with with a ghost and with any other spirit manifestation like that. It's demonic. The problem is, where did the demons come from? Did God create them as demons? I do not believe that. I do not believe that. He may very well have created them as spirit beings, like a cherubim and a seraphim, but somewhere along the line they fell and became the wicked spirit, the unclean spirit that they are. And, of course, uh, when you get into this area, a lot of people look at you and think, well, now you need a, you need a good psychologist or psychiatrist to, cry, to try to, to kind of help you along the way because don't you realize today that uh, 21st century man is far too enlightened 
to believe in evil spirits and what have you. But just a few months back, this boy walked up a wall backwards. And that was witnessed by a number of people. And there's no way that you can explain that away. In other words, it defied all the laws of physics. If Einstein were alive today and knew about that, <coughs> he'd be wondering what went on. By the way, I was reading a quote of Einstein the other day. And he made this quote about the Lord. He said, Ah, how subtle is the Lord. That's what Einstein said. How subtle. How, how, the, how the different ways he can make himself known and the different ways that he does things. And apparently Einstein was able to discern some of that. Einstein, folks, was no atheist. And if anybody ever tells you he was an atheist, you're talking to somebody that's been reading somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about. Einstein did certainly believe in God. So where do they come from? What are they? I'm not going to tell you I know. <coughs> I'll leave that open. I don't know. I can't prove one. I can't give you, I can't quote you one verse of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation <coughs> that tells you where a demon came from. Now, I've read some good men. I've got some men I respect, and they'll just come out and point blank and say, well, they're fallen angels. Well, that, that's their opinion. If that's what they want to believe, that's fine. But I don't have to believe that. I don't have to accept that. So I'll just leave it with you. This is one of these things where th that, uh, you know, I can't say. Uh, maybe they are the spirits of a pre-Adamite race. Maybe they are the spirits of the Nephilim that were destroyed in Genesis 6. Uh, whatever they are, they're wicked, intelligent spirit beings. And you don't want to mess with them. And they can cause you all kinds of trouble. And they are evil. They are evil. They are wicked. Another airplane has gone down. 160-something uh, souls on board. And apparently the scenario surrounding this airplane is very similar to the last one. It was at flight level about 30,000, 35,000 feet and just disappeared off the radar. Any, any aircraft that's flying, folks, at that air, at that, any commercial aircraft that's flying is in constant contact with the ground, constant. And uh, it lost contact. The ground lost contact with it. And now they're out in the search and rescue right now trying to find this aircraft I had 17 children on board and it's gone. It's like flight, uh, what was it, 370, the Malaysian flight that just came up missing. They haven't found as much as a nut or a bolt, and uh, they're just disappearing all of a sudden. Uh, have you ever heard of a false flag operation? A false flag operation is something that happens when uh, they want you to believe something, but the ones who are perpetrating it have a much higher motive behind it. And that's what happens with a false flag. And uh, I'm not saying this is, but I'm saying it is strange, isn't it, that another aircraft now has gone missing. They may find it. Who knows? Uh, it, went all, it went missing, too. I think this one went missing over water. <coughs> I'm not sure exactly all the details, but I think it was missing over water. Flight 370, they think, went missing over water. And uh, so why do I bring that in? Because I'm, what I'm going to be bringing in to you in just a few minutes. I'm going to read some of the most uh, thought-provoking material that you could possibly hear, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to think about it, and I want you to leave this, after, leave this house today and go home this afternoon and think about these things that I'm going to tell you. Do as Mary did when the angel spoke to her, and the Bible said she pondered these things in her heart. She thought about them. Uh, things are not always as they appear. That's for certain. But the Bible has a lot to say about these creatures. In, uh, it talks about them, and they are creatures, by the way, they are intelligent because they do know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 29. They know who he is if modern man doesn't. <laughs> Matthew eight twenty-nine. They know more than a lot of PhDs do. Matthew eight twenty-nine, And behold, verse 28, the context, the Gergesenes possessed with devils. Verse 29. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus? Who? Thou Son of God. And uh, that's quite remarkable. In Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 41, remember, as I've said before, and firmly believe, that uh, just because a creature is a spirit being, it doesn't mean that it knows all things. There's only one that knows everything. 
That's the Almighty. Luke chapter 4, verse 41. And devils also came out of many crying and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. The point is that uh, they spoke the truth, but the Lord Jesus didn't want it coming from that source. He wanted the witness of the Holy Spirit, not the witness of a demon. Uh, and the one, that young girl over there in the book of Acts that was possessed of a spirit of python, that's what it was, python, the snake, a spirit of divination. And she followed along behind them and said, these be, the, these be the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. What she said was true, absolutely true. But the Apostle Paul rebuked that spirit because he did not want that spirit to witness to the ministry of the apostle. He did not want that source because had he accepted that source, had he allowed her to follow on and continue to follow him, then they would look to her for a source of wisdom. Yep. See, the people would have flocked around her and the worst lie is a lie that's a partial truth. Amen. That's the one you'll swallow, the one that's a partial truth. And that's the one Satan uses. And that's exactly the way propaganda works. They give you a certain amount of the truth. So demons are real. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 19. What I say then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything, the idol is nothing, but it's the spirit invoked when the idol is brought forth. And by the way, what is an idol? An idol is anything that is brought up before you that takes the place of God. And you allow that thing to be worshipped in your life, honored, reverenced, or any, any, any uh, nuance like that. It becomes an idol. So in verse 20, I say the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Notice verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So he makes it very clear that there is a conflict going on here, a conflict. And the conflict is between the, the evil spirit world and the Holy Spirit, and they're conflicting. It's, it's a combat, and it's, and it's the kind of thing that is ongoing. It doesn't, it doesn't cease. It's a, it's a war of attrition, constantly being fought. You're being sniped at, and it's coming at you from different directions and different modes. So the Gentiles, when they offer up their sacrifices or have their services or their appear to be such ignorant, meaningless uh, uh, sayings and what have you, remember this. this. These things are to demons. There is a reality behind it. The thing itself is nothing. A totem pole is nothing. A carved out fixture, an oak tree or any of this other stuff is nothing in itself. But it is the demon behind it. It's the devil behind it. So it's important to remember that, and this is going to bring me to uh, it's going to bring me to uh, what I want to read to you because I want to get into it, and then we'll get back to this. Uh, by the way, the Exorcist, I uh, uh, I uh, foolish enough, uh, right uh, when I f I think I had just been saved no time hadn't been saved any time 1973, in Rochester, Minnesota, when I had my wife to Mayo Clinic. Uh, I was foolish enough to go see The Exorcist. And I had never in my life before seen anything like that. And uh, I would not recommend that. As I haven't been in a movie theater now in 30-something years. But, it, you know, that doesn't make me righteous. But I'm trying to make a point. I didn't have any sense. I was stupid. I was a newborn babe in Christ. And I went in that theater and I watched that thing. And I watched this girl levitate. And then I saw the face, and I saw, the, I saw the, the wickedness, and they did a good job. And a lot of things associated with that movie right there were very strange. A lot of things were strange. And the bottom line is that when you start messing around with demons, they come out. And they're vain, and they'll come out. And so uh, it took me a long time to get over that. The Exorcist is based upon reality. It was not a girl, but it was a 14-year-old boy, I think, that was possessed with a demon. I listened to a Catholic priest the other day. He's in his 70s or 80s now. And he was one of the priests who said he was there. He was, he was involved in the actual uh, exorcism of this boy. Now, whatever you might believe about it one way or another, about the Catholic priest, you know, 
I wanted to hear what he had to say because here's the man who was personally involved in it. He said, oh, yes. He said that boy rose right up off the bed. He said he levitated in the air. There he was. Well, that defies the laws of physics. You can't explain that. You know, you can't explain it. Physically, you can't explain it. The natural man runs out the door when something like that happens because that goes against everything he was ever taught. He doesn't have any idea what's going on. I do. When, when Pharaoh's magicians can mock what Aaron did with his rod, and Pharaoh's magicians can do a lot of the things that Moses and Aaron did, I understand that there's power in the spirit world. There's power there. And as a Christian, you need to be warned about these things. You need to be wise about them, and you need to leave them alone. And let me say this. I'm not an exorcist. I'm a pastor. I've had to deal with people down through the years that I don't say publicly. I wouldn't say it to them or anyone else, but I personally believed in my heart they had demons. They had demons, and we prayed about that. But as far as somebody bringing somebody into this church and saying, Preacher Lawson, we want you to cast these devils out, you got the wrong place. I'm not an exorcist. I'm a pastor. And my responsibility as a pastor is to watch over you folks. And if I see an evil spirit or the manifestations of an evil spirit, to deal with it. Now, how many of you remember the Olympics in 2012 in Great Britain? All right. How many of you remember the opening and closing ceremony to that Olympics? That really said more than the actual competition did. Listen carefully to what I'm going to read to you this morning because this all ties in, this ties in very well. The 2012 Olympiad in London from July 27, August 12 was also Tishbi Av or the ninth of Av on the Hebrew calendar. The Druid Festival, now I'm going to skip some stuff for the sake of time. I'm going to skip some stuff and move through this because I don't want you to get bored with it. I don't believe you will. If you'll just listen. The Druid festival of Lugnasad traditionally falls between late July and early August. The official feast being August the 1st with many local wicker man festivals. That's a different subject altogether. The wicker man. Put that in the back of your mind. Held during the weeks before on July the 27th, 2012, Tishbiav, the 9th of Av. The horror film, 1973, Wicker Man, was released in British theaters. A scene from this British horror film was shown during the opening ceremony of the London Olympics. Exactly one year later, an edited version of the 73 Wicker Man was released in the United States on July the 27th, 2013. The symbolism of the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony was interpreted by the Stonehenge and Avebury Druids as proof that Druidry is finally officially recognized as the indigenous religion of Great Britain. Indigenous means its source from that area. It is of those people. Olympic opening ceremony, London, 2012. Quotes from the Druids about the opening ceremony. Quote, never before in modern times has so much pagan symbolism been used by the British establishment for a state occasion. The 2012 Olympic opening ceremony was a triumph of expression of British identity that for once did not ignore our cultural and spiritual pre-Christian roots. Now, there's a lot of other quotes here, but I'm not going to read them for the sake of time. Opening the London 2012 Olympic ceremony was a medley of children's choirs from the four countries comprising Great Britain. The choirs sang respectively the British hymn, Jerusalem. I played it for you in here not too long ago. The Irish ballad, Danny Boy, followed by Clydesdale horses marching into the stadium as the Flower of Scotland, and Welch hymn, Bread of Heaven, were sung. Jerusalem is a musical adaptation of William Blake's unorthodox poem about Jesus Christ traveling to Great Britain during his unknown years. Now let that settle in, because that lays the foundation for 
who the people of Great Britain think they are and the monarchy. All right? They believe, and I'm not saying everybody does, but many of them believe the Lord Jesus Christ during those silent years. Now, what are the silent years? What, what are we talking about? Anybody have any idea? What? What? That's right. Twelve until he was baptized of John the Baptist and uh, anointed for his public ministry. Exactly. There's a lot of material out there, folks, that talks, that speaks with authority about what happened to Christ during those silent years. So what do you do with it, preacher? You put it over there in file 13. That's what you do with it. But listen to this. Now this hymn, Jerusalem, is the unofficial national hymn of Great Britain. And here are the words. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green, and was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded there among these dark satanic mills? Now continuing. Jerusalem is the unofficial national anthem of Great Britain. And for this reason, only British subjects seem to understand its import. The hymn is not based upon scripture, but upon apocryphal and pseudepigraphical, pseudep pseudepigraphal books not authored by witnesses to the earthly life of Jesus Christ. They are Gnostic forgeries written to mislead mankind to a false Christ. And you remember, we've gone through Gnosticism in here over and over again. The poem was inspired by the apocryphal story that a young Jesus, accompanied by his uncle Joseph of Arimathea. Have you ever read in the Bible where Joseph is Christ's uncle? But tradition in England teaches that he was. A tin merchant traveled to what is now England, visited Glastonbury during the unknown years of Jesus. The legend is linked to an idea in the book of Revelation describing a second coming wherein Jesus establishes a new Jerusalem. So they call it here on this earth. Now watch it. Blake's poem asked four questions rather than asserting the historical truth of Christ's visit. Thus the poem merely implies that there may or may not have been a divine visit when there was briefly heaven in England. And did these feet in ancient time. Now it continues. Joseph of Arimathea appears in some early New Testament apocrypha. A series of legends grew around him during the Middle Ages, which tied him to Britain and the Holy Grail. Since the second century, a mass of legendary detail has accumulated around the figure of Joseph of Arimathea, in addition to the New Testament references. Joseph is referenced in apocryphal and non-canonical accounts such as the Acts of Pilate, a text often appended to the medieval Gospel of Nicodemus and the narrative of Joseph. Now you all understand when we say apocryphal books, pseudepigraphical books, I've gone through that in here before time and time and time again. It's not part of the canon. The last book in the canon of Scripture is the book of Revelation. Any time you get out of the 66 books of the canon of Scripture, you can get in trouble fast. Amen. You can wind up believing all kinds of stuff that's not supported by the Word of God. That's why the Word of God is so important. Now, continue. Listen carefully now. Watch how this thing unfolds. It was here that legends say Jesus was brought to Glastonbury as a boy by his uncle Joseph of Arimathea during the silent years. The time between the ages of 12 and 33, when the Bible says nothing of his life, some believe he spent these years, now watch this, studying with the ascetic Essenes in the desert. Others suggest he may have been in training here with the Druids in Britain. It's believed that the young Christ came to what is currently England with his uncle, and that Druid priest 
set and learned at his feet. So what are you doing now with Druidry? You're giving it legitimacy because you're saying that its doctrines came straight from the mouth of the Son of God. Now watch carefully. It continues. It is also thought that as a young man, Christ and his uncle constructed a chapel together on the island. Today, the Lady Chapel stands on the site of the original structure on the grounds of Glastonbury Abbey. This rich tradition led by William Blake to write his beautiful poem, And Did These Feet in Ancient Times, which it had been adapted into the hymn, Jerusalem. And apparently they're giving credit for this to Bernard of Clairvaux. Now it gets very interesting. The apocryphal legend tells of Joseph of Arimathea landing at Glastonbury, where he established Britain's first monastery. According to the legend, Joseph became the country's first evangelist and the ancestor of many British monarchs. Let that settle in. Let that settle in deeply. In the book of Timothy, it says, and on the last days that men will be falling for doctrines of demons. Classify demonic activity in two ways. Physical, walking up a wall, levitation, and the other part, which to me is far more sinister, it's the preaching, the teaching, the doctrines of demons. I mean, it's one thing, you know, it's a novel thing to see somebody floating around, but it's another matter when they start preaching a doctrine of a demon. What is a doctrine of a demon? Listen to this. <coughs> British monarchs. As the legend developed over centuries, Joseph was alleged to have brought the Holy Grail to Britain, which gave rise to the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. According to the legend, King Arthur and Queen Guinevere were buried at Glastonbury Abbey in the cemetery on the south side of the Lady Chapel between two stone pyramids. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. Listen to this. According to British tradition, Joseph of Arimathea was the uncle of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and therefore belonged to the tribe of Judah. Now there's a truth here. The Lord Jesus Christ was the lion of the tribe of what? Judah. But there's not a word about Joseph of Arimathea being her uncle or part of the tribe of Judah. Listen carefully. The legend also claims that Joseph was the ancestor of the mythical King Arthur. We have a messianic bloodline connected with British monarchy. In plain words, the kings and the queens. Even at the present time, the British monarchy claims to be the messianic bloodline of Judah. In actuality, they are the apostate tribe of Dan. Are they a tribe of Dan? Do you know what British Israelism is? What is British Israelism? It's the idea that the ten northern tribes, all right, the ten northern tribes comprise the British people, the English-speaking people, and therefore they have become the new Israel of God. So what's going on? Do you remember the British Empire under Queen Victoria? The sun never set on the British Empire. What causes a nation to want to have an empire? What is an empire? An empire is when one nation takes sovereignty from another nation and annexes, or whatever you want to call it, into its empire. And a lot of times they'll leave a surrogate king like King Herod. He was the king over Judea, and yet Caesar Augustus was the emperor. So he was the emperor over King Herod, along with a lot of other countries. An empire. Why would they want to do that? Could it be because they feel like that they are the ones who have the Holy Grail? 
the holy charge, the holy commission, the holy monarchy, that they are the seat of the wisdom of God, and they're the ones who are commissioned of God Almighty to rule over the earth. You suppose it could be that? Do you know that when uh, President Obama went into office, one of the first things that he did, you know what he did? And I'm sure he enraged the British people when he did it. He sent a bust of Winston Churchill that had been given to the American people. He sent it back to Great Britain. Now, that was a bold move. You know why he did that? Because his father, a Kenyan, was part of the occupying force of the British Empire and had a hatred for Britain and for Brits. And that's where he got that from. And I've got a book at home that's called The Roots of My Rage or something, Roots of Obama's Rage. And it's been a while since I've read that a long time ago. But the connection is made to where a lot of people hate the British. Do you know what Mahatma Gandhi was about in India? You, you know why, what Mahatma Gandhi, how he fits into history? What was he about? It was about peaceful resistance against the British occupation of India. He wanted the Brits out of India and the Indian people to be masters of their own destiny. That's what he wanted. And, of course, when Mahatma Gandhi was alive, he was protesting against them. He fasted. He was a, I think he was a Buddhist and uh, all that. By the way, uh, when you get into this kind of thing, it's not, it's not an easy fix. A 26-year-old uh, Buddhist monk I believe he was 26 or 36, I forget his age, but just a few days ago in late December in Tibet that has been occupied by China, uh, set himself afire and burned himself to death. And to date, 130, I think the figure was 136 Buddhist monks have burned themselves to death in, in, uh, in protest against China, China, that has moved into the Himalayas and took over Tibet. There are many who believe that Tibet is the heart and soul of the Aryan people and the heart and soul of the Buddhist empire, the Buddhist religion in Tibet. You don't just come in and occupy a place and force people to become what you want them to be. You don't make them do, you don't do that. It doesn't work. It never has worked. It never will work. Fact, the fact of the matter is what you do when you do that is that you create an opposition that becomes fanatical and the people start killing themselves right in front of you. It doesn't work. Now, Rome was smart enough to know that. They were smart enough to know that. And when Rome uh, occupied uh, the Holy Land, they let them have their own king, they let them have their temple, and they let them have their religion. And Pontius Pilate's job was to stay there and keep the peace. They didn't try to force them to uh, become Romans. Uh, so, uh, but that's 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 the way it, that's the way it works, and this is what's happening right now with ISIS and all the stuff going on over there in in, uh, in Iraq and Syria. Yes, sir. Yeah, and this is not against the British people. I'm just trying to give this as a historical context. Damn. not there. Yeah. It could be. But but you're right, you're right on it because Dan's not in these not they're not in Revelation 7 and 14 they're not mentioned there in either place in the tribes. Now here's a very interesting thing about this paganism about the pagan symbols of the 
of the uh, Olympiad. Uh, the London Philharmonic Orchestra then played Nimrod, composed by Edward William Elgar. Nimrod, then they, they played a piece entitled Nimrod. Now, what do you think we look like if we came in here on Sunday morning and Brother Sylvia said, would you please turn to page such and such? We're going to sing about Nimrod. <laughs> We're not going to praise Nimrod in here. <laughs> We're not going to do it. But listen to this. Nimrod was the son of Cush, grandson of Ham, whose other son, Canaan, was cursed as were his descendants, the Canaanites. Now, Kyle and Delish, Old Testament commentary, gives the proper interpretation of before the Lord, can only mean in defiance of Jehovah, as Josephus and the Targums understand it. <coughs> it was Nimrod, Josephus says, who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God, he was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand, he persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach. So that's their take on the Tower of Babel, is that it was an attempt by Nimrod in the world to be able to raise something up above the heights of the waters. Now, how high would the water have to be to uh, cover Mount Everest? It's 29,000-something feet. That's what it is. And how many feet in a mile? 5,280, 5, 5 is 25, 5, 6 is 30, a little less than 6 miles high. So they would have to be able to build a tower over 6 miles in height. I would suggest you watch the documentary that I watched the other day about the building of the Tower of Babel by these modern-day scientists who are not necessarily Bible believers, but they talked about the brick and how big a base that they could put and how high a tower could be built and it's mind-boggling as to how high it could be built. So I don't know if it was possible for them, but I mean, the point is this. Do you think the good Lord would have to stop at 30,000 feet? <laughs> so you got your tower, Nimrod. I'm going to put it 60,000 feet this next time when I flood you. You see how vain an attempt like that would be? But the Lord gave them a bow in the heavens, didn't he? Didn't he give them a bow, a rainbow? And what was the purpose and the point of the rainbow? A promise that I'll never again destroy the earth by a flood. So they're singing about Nimrod. They're singing about Nimrod. And he said he would avenge himself of God for destroying their forefathers. In his book, Star Names, Their Love and Meaning, Richard Hinckley Allen wrote that the day that the Jews deified Nimrod as the constellation Orion, Osiris, the solar god, also noting that Orion and Nimrod was a giant. <coughs> Later on, the Jews called Orion Gibor, which is a Hebrew word for strong man. The giant considered as Nimrod bound to the sky for rebellion against Jehovah. But the concept of Nimrod as the mighty hunter before the Lord, at least in the ordinary sense of that word, is erroneous. For the original, according to universal Eastern tradition, signifies a lurking enemy or hunter of men rather than of beast. And that's exactly what Nimrod was, a hunter of men, a hunter of souls. And he was a giant. According to all the traditions that point back to him, Nimrod was a giant. Now that's remarkable too when you think about it. Where did the giants come from? They came from the sons of God and you're the daughters of men, the mighty men of old. The, they're the, the pantheon of the Greek gods. Who were they? The Bible said there were giants in the earth in those days after the sons of God. Real giants? Yes, folks. Uh, it doesn't make a difference how much the Smithsonian tries to cover it up, folks. There is unbelievable evidence scattered all over the world for the existence of giants. Giants. And in some places, their height is mind-boggling. In some cases, 
30 feet tall. In some uh, records, I think Buffalo Bill Cody, you remember him, Buffalo Bill, uh, he had uh, lived with the Indians quite a bit, and the tradition among the Indians was that there was a race of giants that lived out west that were so big that they could grab a running buffalo, and like you'd grab a cat, and put it under their arm and take off with it. Now, that's a huge creature. You say, well, now, nothing like that exists today, preacher. I know you don't see anything like that existing right now. But I believe the Bible. Amen. I believe the Bible. Now, how tall they were, they all, it's not all the universal size. It's not consistent. But I believe when the Bible says giant, it means giant. It means giant. So this Olympiad in London, England, was a, a notation to the world that the pagan culture that underlies what's going on in the governments of the world is alive and well. But the more sinister part about what's going on in England is not only the fact that a pagan culture is underlying what's going on in the world, but there is a merger now of Christianity and Druidism, of Christ and the occult, a new Christ, a false Christ, a pseudo-Christ. The great deception of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 is beginning to unfold right before you. And you've got to remember this. He that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The only reason that the floodgates have not opened before you and all hell has broken loose upon the earth is because the Holy One is holding it back. And they're making every effort to do exactly what they intend to do. They're holding it back. I can look at Russia and see what's happening with Russia right now. Ask yourself this question. We have had, since September, a record-breaking, record-breaking, first time it's ever happened in American history, a successive day after day after day fall in gasoline prices. The average price of a, of a barrel of, of oil is, is, good night, we've done run out of time, is is under $60. When this started, it was over 100 There are places in this country right now that are selling a gallon of gasoline for less than $2. All right, quickly to the point. Russia's economy is built upon oil. That means that their economy is beginning to tank. Just a few months ago, Vladimir Putin went into the Ukraine. He let the New World Order know he was not part of the New World Order. Now look at the oil prices. Why? Ask yourself that question. Why? Is it because they've discovered so much more oil? I know the fracking out there, the Bakken oil, uh, uh, shale oil, uh, no oil process involved in it. It's, I think water hydraulic pressure is used, and they're producing all this oil now. America is going to be oil independent. What's happening is that these powers, the movers and the shakers of the world's powers, are beginning to dovetail and come together and bring exactly what they want to bring. They're going to bring the man on the scene, the Antichrist. Get ready. He's at the door. Yes, sir. All right, we'll have word of prayer. We'll let you go. Brother Gene Lawson, you can dismiss us, please.